Let me first start by introducing you into the subject. Uh, we have been using no since about uh, over two decades, most genetic reference populations. And the one which we've used a lot is the, this population called BXD. B stands for a cross between a B6 mother and a DBA father. And there have been F2s generated a long time ago, 40 years ago. And now there's about 185 of these mouse strains available. They're all genetically distinct, but you can, uh, they're actually all clones also. So you can generate many of them. And here you see actually the phenotypic variation in these mice with code colors uh, variation indicated. Okay, there are about 5 million sequence variants similar to uh, variants in human populations with segregated in these mouse. And this means there is about 4,700 genes with protein coding variants, meaning you study about 4,700 mutants at the same time, from which 2,000 have predicted high impact variants. And 6,000 of them uh, 2,000 of them have a high predict high impact variant. And why this population is very particular is because there are 6,000 clinical phenotypes and molecular phenotypes in 35 tissues. And all of them you can look up on these two databases. Now, if we organize the phenotypes, the clinical and the molecular phenotypes <clears throat> in these strains, uh, then we can... Uh, actually create these type of graphs. So we here have the 185 DXD strains. And here, every line, there are 6,000 lines in this graph of where represent phenotypes. And they are ordered by the labs who made them. And you see a lot of white here. White means that there are no phenotypes corrected here, collected in this place. And this makes this overview very similar to medical records, electronic health records, where not every patient gets every disease. And so this population is a good way to mimic personal health. But where it stands apart if when it comes to the molecular phenotypes, here we have 35, and you rarely in humans will have 35 deep bio biopsies with molecular characterization. For the liver, for instance, you have chow and high fat diet, you have fasting, feeding, male, female, young, old, eight different uh, sets of data, which complement and which make this molecular phenotype one of the largest phenomes in the world with over 500 million data points. Now, as just one further introduction to genetics, <clears throat> How you can conceive genetics is that we make and pre-calculate matrices where we correlate phenotypes, 6,000, and our genotypes spread along the chromosomes. Every dot here is a significant association. <clears throat> the darker the dot, the more significant it becomes. And you can scan it in a forward genetic way. For instance, say, I'm interested in finding the genes which uh, determine body weight and you scan along this axis and then you get what is called a Manhattan plot. And you see here that you have one uh, strong candidate with this ribosomal protein, large subunit 26. We soon will have all our genetic passports. If you don't have it already, many people have, including me, I have a full genome done on myself with 100X. And no, I can look actually, I can say, I have a variant in RPL26, and you can scan along this red line and say, what are the phenotypes I have? And I would see, you see body weight again, but no, you also see fat mass and you see VO2 max. So the, the PWAS, what's called, this phenome-wide association study is much more powerful because it shows pleiotropy. You don't get one phenotype, but all the phenotypes. Now, given that we have transcripts and proteins in these mice, we can do also transcript or protein-wide association study, or EFIWAS, the same principle. You align the phenome, but instead of having here genotypic variant, you have here your transcripts. <clears throat> and again, you can scan them in a forward way, say, what determines VO2 max in the liver? And then you see that VO2 max actually is determined by this uh, transporter, malate, malonate transporter, SLC25A in the liver. 
And if you know that you have an aberrant expression of your gene in a tissue, you can do the reverse and do what is called EFI was. And now you see, if you have an aberrant expression of SLC25810, I have changed the VO2 max, high fat mass, and high body mass. All this you can do yourself when you type in your favorite gene and play a little bit with this website called uh, systemgenetic.org. 90% of the mitochondrial 1500 proteins or so are made in the nucleus, translated in the cytosol, and then imported, and they will compose subunits of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. The mitochondrial DNA itself encodes 13 mRNAs, which are translated by these mitochondrial ribosomal proteins, which originate <clears throat> actually in these mitochondrial ribosomal proteins originate in the cytosol. No, if you don't have these mitochondrial ribosomal proteins, what happens is that the mitochondrial proteins fall away and you have a stoichiometric imbalance in your electron transport chain, which will induce a mitochondrial stress response, abbreviated as MSR. And this response is constituted of the unfolded protein response of the mitochondria as it induces heat shock proteins and proteases, chaperones, and if it continues this MSR, also involves mitophagy, which you can go via pink and park. Now, this brings me to a central paradigm uh, of, of this uh, talk, is that both mitochondrial disruption, and I showed you inhibition of mitoribosomes, but it happens also in aging or inhibition of oxphos, or stimulation of mitochondria, such as with rapamycin or with NR, I just showed you, induce this stress response, this mitonuclear proteotoxic stress. This leads to the unfolded protein response and mitophagy, and this bolsters, strengthens proteostasis and increases longevity. <clears throat> now, the question was, can we exploit this therapeutically? Can we give an inhibitor of mitochondria such as doxycycline, induce this mitochondrial stress response and get an improved mitochondrial homeostasis, or likewise, activate mitochondria with nicotinamide riboside and get the same effect. So that's one way we could do. If we inhibit mitochondrial stress, we can make more robust mitochondria and we can use this in a disease setting. And we have no data that this works in other diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. And we're also testing it currently, mitochondrial infarction. But what about the opposite? Can we activate mitochondria, now with nicotinamide riboside, induce these processes and make mitochondria more robust? Here we show you some data in a C. elegans model of Alzheimer's disease. These worms overexpress the amyloid beta protein 142 variant. So it's the cleaved variant, the toxic variant. And so there's no effect on cleavage. And if we treat these worms with nicotinamide riboside, we see that we induce the UPR in yellow or mitophagy. We also see that we clear the aggregates in these worms. These worms have aggregates because they overexpress the A beta protein. We reduce those and they express it in the muscle. So they lose muscle mobility very fast in the red. But if you treat them with NR, you can sustain this. The same we can transfer to a human system, where here we have the SHSY, 5Y uh, <clears throat> uh, neuroblastoma cells, which overexpress the Swedish variant of. Uh, APP, you see here stains with the cell stained with a beta, you see aggregates and you reduce them. Also took it into a mouse study and here he overexpressed and uh, he treated APP P sen, these are the 2TG Alzheimer mouse and he stained half brains with thioflavin S which stains aggregates which you see here. You see that actually there's a lot of aggregates in these mice. If you treat with NR, we reduce them. And we have an effect on functionality. And that's shown here. We did actually a test which is called <clears throat> the fear conditioning test, 
In this test, you give a mouse, put him in a box, you give it a painful stimuli, like an electric shock, which you associate with a cue, in our case, a loud noise. The next day, when you repeat this and give the mouse a loud noise, but without electric stimulus, a normal mouse will freeze, indicated in the red curve, about half of the time. An Alzheimer mouse wouldn't freeze because it doesn't recall that this noise is associated or can be associated with a painful stimulus. But if we now treat the blue mice here with an R, we bring this back up to normal. <laughs> now, another fellow in the lab, Mar Mario Romano, he emitted the hypothesis, perhaps these aggregates are not only typical for neurodegeneration, but are typical for all age-related disease. And he actually looked into muscle tissue, which we had collected before, actually Dong Ryu and Hong Gozan collected muscle tissues from all mice. And here you see, we stain them here with an oligomer A11 antibody. In young mice, there's no aggregates. In old mice, there's massive aggregates in the tibialis anterior. If you treat in young mice with an R, no effect. But if you treat old mice with an R, no, you see a massive reduction in these aggregates. We just quantify here. This treatment with NR actually also improves mitochondrial function. You see here in the top line that MTCO1 is down in show treated animals, and that uh, in show treated aged animals, three subjects very aged, and this is a representative staining. And these are subjects with a disease of the muscle, aggregation disease, which is called inclusion body myositis. It's like the Alzheimer of the muscle. And when you stain these uh, uh, cells, you see that with proteostat, which stains aggregating proteins, you see aggregates in old and in IBM muscle cells. And you basically reduce them by increasing NAD levels, by giving NR, but also by inhibiting PARP, which is another a strategy to increase NAD levels. Rare researchers can have their favorite compound tested for anti-aging effects. And the study is actually carried out in a very ingenious way. It's happening in three different sites in the JACs, in the University of Michigan, and in Texas, San Antonio. And it's done in a heterogeneous uh, population, which is a cross between BAL, C57, Black 6, C3H, and DBH. And the F2 offsprings are the ones which are tested. And so far, there have been 20 compounds tested in large, very well-powered studies. But what has been never done is look at the survival of the normal ones. And what we did is actually took the tail of the normal mice. These were 2,356 non-treated controls and 920 drug-treated controls where the drug didn't have an impact on lifespan. We have lifespan data in this mouse, we have body weight data, and as I said, we have the DNA collected from the tails, and we have in selected animals, we have done liver RNA seq. <clears throat> but I'm not going to talk about data uh, expression data. Now, the interesting thing this is a huge study, this is the most powered longevity study in the mouse as such, uh, that we can recapitulate a lot of the findings in humans. If we look, and these are not rocket science, but just we can confirm that females here in the red have lower early um, uh, deaths than males. These males are not exposed to any of the violence, any traumatic things which we are usually associated with. And we see this very significant difference in survival early on in life in females. Later on, they catch on. The second thing which was very interesting was if we know carve these mice up in different lifespan groups and red mice which die between 6 and 12 months, 12 and 18 months, etc. And if we look, let's focus on the males in the blue at the bottom. We see that the males which die early at 6 between 12 months are the ones which have the highest body weight. The same with these early deaths between 12 and 18 months. And this situation changes gradually if we go along. 
And you can express this in another way. It is called the hazard ratio. This gives you the risk of dying if you weigh 10 grams more as a mice. It's called the hazard ratio. And you see that if you weigh 10 grams more, you have about a 1.8-fold increased risk of dying in a mouse when you're young. This decreases throughout life. And actually, when you're old, no, you have a negative hazard ratio. That means if you're overweight when you're old, let's say my age, it's a beneficial thing. If you're overweight when you're young, it's a very bad thing. Now you will say, this is mouse, what about humans? So we took this into humans and we used the concept of what's called Mendelian randomization. In Mendelian randomization, you use the relationship between an instrument and an exposure to establish the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Like for instance, the instrument is a variant in the LDL receptor. The exposure is your LDL receptor cholesterol. If this is linked, you can say that LDL cholesterol is also linked with coronary artery disease. It's a way to show causality in humans. And we use the 500,000 people in UK Biobank. And what we did is we used here as exposure, either BMI or early body weight, and as outcome, parental longevity of BMI. Now, if our exposure was body weight at 10 years, these are people which are fat when they're 10 years old, and we looked at their lifespan, we saw that the lifespan decreased if you were fat when you were young. If we look at the relationship between body weight at 10 years and body mass index or body weight in adults, we saw what expected. If you are fat when you're young, you are at risk of becoming fat when you're old. However, what was striking that, that your old body weight, your BMI when you're old has no relationship with longevity or a very tiny negative relationship. So also in humans, we could see that body weight not by itself, but body weight at young age is important determinant of longevity. The disappointment in this uh, paper was that this was the most power, most longevity study, and we could not find any universal longevity locus if we did scans for males and females in red and blue. You see that we find a female-specific locus on chromosome 3, and for the males in this study, we found no locus which reached the statistical significant threshold. We found a few loci in males, which became significant if we truncated the population, actually looked at the very old mice, the mice which survived in the 80, the 80 if we truncated 80% of the mice. Now, in the last few minutes, I would like to tell you about an ongoing study about health span and mitochondrial stress in the HDP. The HDP stands for Health Span Diversity Panel. And this is even a larger study which we undertook in our lab. And the question what we ask is, we are all on a different health span trajectory. Like for instance, the person here in green, he has a high health span. He starts only to encounter disease late in life. Most of us will have an average length health span and some of us will have a low health span. Now, in the European Union, 12% of lives are lived unhealthy. That means the 12%, if you're a person, let's say he becomes 100 years old, he will live from his 90, 88 years unhealthy. If he only lives until 80, he will have the last part of his life living in unhealthy conditions. And our goal is to actually shift this curve to the green curve. So the goal of this study is, can we define health span metrics and trajectories from clinical phenotypes? Can we identify genetic and molecular regulators of health span? And can we improve health span trajectory and decelerate the decline of fitness? So this is not a lifespan study. The previous work was all lifespan. This is health span. And so the study design is uh, the following. 
We took 90 different strains, 30 BXDs, 30 collaborative frozen strains, and 30 inbred strains. We divided them in two pipelines. The first pipeline is called the tissue collection pipeline, the second one where we phenotype them. In this pipeline, we sacrifice mice at two, eight, and 18 months, either in control conditions or after a short-term treatment with NR or DOCS. We biobanked samples, over 23 tissues, and we have now over 100,000 samples from 80 strains in our freezers. They will allow us to get molecular signatures. In the meantime, in parallel, we pushed mice through a phenotyping pipeline. And this is a quite unique phenotyping pipeline because the mice are housed throughout their entire life in what we call digital ventilated cages, where we monitor home cage activity of the mice and their environment with a one minute precision over their entire lifespan. The current recorders is more than 150 years worth of mouse lifespan recordings with a one minute interval. Then we phenotyped the mice at four months and at 16 months, they were subjected to an intensive phenotyping protocol covering neurobehavioral, like rotorot studies, open field object recognition, echo MRI for fat mass, PO2 max with the Prometheon, blood pressure, OGTT, echocardiography, uh, maximal exercise tolerance, and urine. 